everyone. I'm Katie Couric, and this is the Yahoo News Special Report. Well, it is a deal. After more than 18 days of tense talks and nearly two years of negotiating, the U.S. and five other nations have now reached an unprecedented nuclear agreement with Iran. President Obama made the announcement early this morning. Today, because America negotiated from a position of strength and principle, we have stopped the spread of nuclear weapons in this region. Because of this deal, the international community will be able to verify that the Islamic Republic of Iran will not develop a nuclear weapon. That means this deal is not built on trust. It is built on verification. And it didn't take long for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to respond. The concern, of course, is that the militant Islamic State of Iran um, is going to receive uh, a sure path to nuclear weapons. Many of the restrictions that were supposed to prevent it from getting there will be lifted. And in addition, Iran will get a jackpot, of a cash bonanza of hundreds of billions of dollars, which will enable it to continue to pursue its aggression and terror in the region and in the world. This is uh, a bad mistake uh, of historic proportions. So what exactly did the U.S. and its partners agree to, and what does it mean for the future of the Middle East? We're going to answer some of your questions. These were among the most searched questions on the topic on Yahoo today. What's the alternative to this deal? What does this mean for gas prices? And what happens next? We'll be talking about those, among other things. Mark Wallace is the CEO of United Against Nuclear Iran, and Kareem Sajapur is an expert on Iran and a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment. Mark, let me start with you. I think a lot of Americans are wondering, what exactly does this mean? And of course, you've been following this chapter and verse. Can you walk us through some of the key components of this deal? Sure. For years, Iran has been an outlaw in the international community. And one of the areas that's been an outlaw, in addition to terrorism and the like, is a nuclear program that had all the hallmarks of a military program, meaning nuclear weapons. Uh, Iran couched it in the guise of civilian nuclear power, but I don't think any serious person believed that Iran's nuclear program was for peaceful civilian purposes. This agreement was designed to ostensibly ease sanctions in exchange for Iran verifiably ending its military nuclear program. And now I think the debate will be, does it do that? Uh, and some of the issues that are out there are whether or not it, inspectors from the UN's IAEA can go in and immediately inspect uh, their facilities to make sure that it's not engaging in military type activities, whether or not um, uh, Iran is shipping illicit materials related to an arms embargo, and how Iran is going to receive sanctions eased money. So there, it's a very complicated deal, I think 159 pages long. I think a lot of the hallmarks of the deal are already causing some heartburn in Washington, and you're going to see that heavily debated in Washington over the next 60 days. So clearly there are a lot of question marks, but before we get to those, what exactly was agreed to? So the sanctions are going to be lifted, correct? Correct. Around $150 billion of money will be effectively transferred to Iran. In exchange, Iran has has agreed to some inspections. I think there's some debate as to the extent of those uh, inspections. It's also agreed to at least have some discussions about its previous military work associated with nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and aren't they lower the, lowering the uranium in, enrichment? Correct. Enriching uranium is, is a, not a necessary component of civilian nuclear fuel. This agreement allows Iran to continue to enrich uranium, but places limitations on the amount it can build up and the way it can, it can deploy that uranium. I think that's one of the key issues as well. So it's exchanging some of its military capability in exchange for sanctions relief. And I think that the debate will be, is that good enough? And, you know, we, we've heard about trust and verification, but the big question has been is how much access will inspectors have to certain sites? And I know that was a big sticking point, right, Mark? So what 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 was decided on that front? I think you're actually going to see another war of statements. You, you remember the interim agreement that came out a few months ago that, that predated this one. After that agreement, the Iranians put out one statement describing what the inspections would look like, and the Americans put out another statement, and there were differences. I think you're going to see perhaps differences of interpretation. There's all sorts of fighting and discussion over something called the additional protocol which is analogous to almost any time, anywhere inspections. But the agreement currently drafted, which we're still studying, 
suggests that there's a fairly bureaucratic process for UN inspectors to get in there and review their sites. So I think you're going to see a lot of debate about that. So the devil will be in the details, basically, right? I think 159 pages of details. Oh, wow. And Kareem, you know how the Iranian government works probably better than anyone. The president of Iran, uh, Iranian President Rouhani, tweeted this morning, today is a new chapter to work towards growth and development of our dear Iran, a day for our youth to, to dream again for a brighter future. So what exactly does this mean for Iran, and do Iranians have as many questions about this that many Americans apparently are having? Uh, Katie, I would say Iran is really a country divided. It's a very young population. Um, the median age is under 30. Um, the, the young people in Iran want to be like South Korea. They want to be economically prosperous. They want to be integrated. They're probably the most pro-American society in the Middle East. And I think today was, was, a, was a day of celebration for them, not necessarily because of their centrifuges or enriched uranium, but the fact that it, it looks like the country is, is going to be uh, ending 12 years of economic and political isolation. But you know, at the same time, it's governed by a very hardline leadership, which is ruthlessly committed to preserving their power, to preserving the status quo. So. I think we need to be very sober about um, you know, what this deal means for both uh, nuclear proliferation, the U.S.-Iran relationship, and Iran moving forward. I, I don't see this the same way um, we, we saw the U.S.-Cuba rapprochement and the normalization of relations. I think that um, from the standpoint of Iran's hardline leadership, this was merely a short-term tactical compromise, but they're not going to and their hostility towards the United States. So you sound very skeptical about this deal because of the Iranian leadership. I mean, it's a short-term strategy. So what is the end game for those people? Well, you know, I, 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 I'm supportive of the deal simply because I think that I, I, I don't think there's any great alternatives. But I, I do think we need to be sober about what the deal entails. And I think, as Mark put it well, um, this isn't a resolution to the conflict. Over the next years, it's going to be, you know, very challenging to, to implement and verify the deal. And I'm sure there's some discrepancies between our interpretation of, of the deal and Iran's interpretation of, of, of the deal. But, but I think over the long term, if you can kind of crack open uh, Iran politically and economically, and you can empower moderate forces who want to put the country's national interest before revolutionary ideology. That's certainly in U.S. interest. And do you think that's a possibility? I mean, how likely is it that that, that part of the Iranian uh, people will, in fact, be given the power necessary to enact real change inside that country? I, I don't see it. I wouldn't predict it happening in, in the short term, in the next months or the next year. But, but certainly over time, um, you increasingly have a country in which the vast majority were born after the 1979 revolution. So they're not committed to revolutionary ideology. They're committed to better quality of life and being part of the outside world. So from that perspective, over the medium and long term, I am optimistic. But I think there are valid concerns in the short term that by removing the sanctions, the deal will enrich the revolutionary guards and the regional proxies like the Assad regime in Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Shia militias in Iraq. Let me ask you how damaging those sanctions have been. Since 1979, the U.S. has imposed sanctions against Iran. Other countries later followed suit. Um, how damaging have they been to the Iranian economy? Can you give us a sense of that, Kareem? It's, there have been kind of three factors that have debilitated the Iranian economy. The first, as you mentioned, are the sanctions. And basically, the way the sanctions were set up by the U.S. Congress was it essentially forced major uh, companies and countries around the world to make a simple choice. And that is, do you want to do business with America or do you want to do business with Iran? And for the vast majority of, of countries and companies in the world, that was a very easy choice. So Iran went from exporting uh, over 4 million barrels per day, and oil is its chief source of revenue, um, to, to, to exporting uh, less than two. Um, so, so um, you know, 
I think that the, it was the sanctions, it was the drop in oil prices, and the billions of dollars Iran has been spending to sustain the, the Assad regime in Syria. I think the combination of those three um, were, were really what forced Iran into this nuclear compromise. Meanwhile, Mark, you know, there's something in the agreement that says <clears throat> sanctions can, in fact, be reimposed if the Iranians don't mind their P's and Q's, if you will. Is that enough to really kind of motivate them to, to fall in line when it comes to this deal? Well, we should be very clear. The sanctions had a huge effect on Iran. As, as Kareem said, their currency was dramatically devalued. The IRGC, which controls the economy and are the Ayatollah's cronies, effectively, were really uh, stretched and were trying to enrich themselves at the same time. So this sanctions relief is giving them an enormous amount of money to continue to empire build in the region and to engage in any mischief that they want to engage in. The notion of snapback sanctions is going to be one of those points that's highly debated. There are going to be a lot of them in the agreement. And imagine the Security Council doing anything quickly. The security, UN Security Council, Katie, we both know that the UN Security Council isn't quick to do anything, particularly when the Russian and, Russians and Chinese wield a veto on that Security Council. And the provisions of this sanction snapback require the Security Council to quickly reimpose sanctions. And uh, having been a diplomat at the UN, I can uh, tell you nothing happens too quickly at the UN, particularly when the Chinese and Russians are involved and they have an economic interest in trading with Iran. So you don't think this says th these, this sort of snapback thing has has teeth, if you will? I think of all the provisions uh, sort of that some of us think is a bit unserious is this notion that the UN Security Council will magically reimpose sanctions quickly without any debate and without the Russians and Chinese acting up. I think that's a bit unrealistic. Kareem, what did you make of Benjamin Netanyahu's reaction to this? I mean, it's no surprise, clearly, but um, I just would like to hear what how you would respond to that. Well, Netanyahu has always maintained that Iran poses an existential threat. The nuclear-armed Iran poses an exist existential threat. And, you know, from his perspective, you can understand why he's concerned about Iran getting billions of dollars in, in sanctions relief, because Iran is supporting groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, which are um, actively um, fighting Israel's existence. Um, but... You know, I think that the, the challenge Netanyahu has always had is, is providing um, a kind of a, a plausible alternative. And I think that's where he and, and many um, folks on the right in the United States failed, that it's, it's kind of easy to, to critique this deal. It's very easy to critique the behavior of the Iranian regime. Um, but if you're tasked with uh, coming up with a kind of a plausible diplomatic alternative, um, it's, it's much more difficult. Mark, what, what does this do to U.S.-Israeli relations, which are already obviously strained as a result of this? Look, I think this is historic in many senses, uh, including our relationship with Israel. Israel views this as an existential uh, matter, ex existential crisis. And there are alternatives. I think one of the problems is you're seeing a bit of demagoguery on, on both sides. Those that say, unless you support the deal, you are advocating for war. I think that's a false choice. And I think our Israeli friends, a lot of our um, Middle East allies, uh, the Sunni Arabs in, in the region, don't see that choice. They say, let's continue the status quo. The sanctions were working. We don't have to go to war necessarily. This regime relies on trade, relies on oil sales. And it was so close to being truly pressured. If anything, this infusion of money that we are giving them arguably cements the Ayatollah and this regime into power and makes them much less vulnerable to overthrow by a people that are truly wonderful so the and argument, dissatisfied. Was the argument give it a little more time? Yeah, I think that for those of us that, that heard this sort of warmongering argument, support the deal or you want war, I think that's a false choice. Give it more time. Make it clear to the Iranians who clearly came to the table because of these economic sanctions. Say to them, look, you're not going to have a viable, sustainable economy unless you agree to a real diplomatic agreement that has teeth. And I think now that um, we see the, the agreement taking shape, there's concern that we gave up too much, not realizing the leverage that we had um, with these economic sanctions. And the choice, you know, saying to those, 
do business with the United States or do business with Iran, that's not war. That's just choosing to do business with those who we think are doing the right thing. And I think that is a clear alternative. And there should be no mistake. We can say to businesses and companies around the world, if we didn't have this deal, if you want to do business in the United States, the greatest economy in the world, you can't do business in Iran until they start doing things in a responsible, reasonable manner. That's a clear alternative. That was the architecture of the sanctions regime. And, uh, you know, I think we have to remember that. Closer to home, will this drive, this will drive gas prices further down because of all this oil that now becomes available for export, right? Uh, it will. Already the oil price was at uh, recent historic lows. Saudi Arabia had indicated it was opening its spigots and not cutting off supply. So already the oil price was low. There was a glut of the market, and they're even lower. Imagine if we had continuing sanctions and a low oil price. Imagine the pressure on the Ayatollah. And in some ways, I think that might be... Looking back on this 10 years from now, that might be the missed opportunity. If we had this low oil price when we had the height of sanctions a year or two, two years ago, imagine what that would have done to the Ayatollah's economy. What do you think that would have done to the Ayatollah's economy, Kareem? Do you think that would have been effective? Well, the, the problem, Katie, is that the economic well-being of the Iranian people has never been the top priority of the regime. There have been willing to subject their population to economic hardship uh, in order to forward their their ideological goals so it's it's you know it's tough to predict that they would have they would have buckled under that type of uh, of pressure but you know i i really think that if you look at the the history of arms control deals with authoritarian adversarial regimes whether that was you know with the soviet union with North Korea, with Saddam Hussein's Iraq, with Libya, it's it's really a, a mixed bag. And um, the, you know, I think when we look back on this five years from now, six years from now, we'll probably be analyzing it in a much different way. And I think there there are valid um, valid hopes that this could help transform Iran, and there are certainly valid valid fears that this emboldens Iran. Do you think this deal is, as the president has insisted, is better than nothing? Or what about the sort of whole notion of holding out and letting sanctions continue to do, do the, you know, their work, if you will? Well, you know, this, um, I, I think you have to look at it in the context of where we are as a country. If we were having this conversation 10, 12 years ago, it would be a much different debate. But we're having this conversation after a decade and a half of, of, of blood and treasure spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think for that reason, President Obama has, and has, a, has, a, has had a popular mandate um, to try to resolve this issue diplomatically. And I think that when you look at the opinion polls of Americans about this issue, you can see people are very conflicted because on one hand, the vast majority uh, favor diplomacy and engagement with Iran. On the other hand, the vast majority are very skeptical about the Iranian regime and very skeptical that Iran will make good on its promises. And I think those are, those are both you know, very understandable considerations. And I'm sure, Mark, Congress will be thinking about that. They have 60 days, right, where That's they right. could scuttle the deal. They don't ha have to approve it, but they could dismantle it. Is that right? I think you're seeing um, they could disprove it, Katie. I think you're going to see a series of potentially historic votes, even getting to a vote on the deal, which I think will happen, uh, then a vote on the deal. And I think when you look at the breakdown right now, it's more likely than not that Congress votes against the deal. And if that happens, we would be facing a presidential veto and maybe even a vote to override a veto. So you're looking at a series of historic congressional debates uh, that will be very uh, contentious and very heartfelt because this is very uh, a hugely important issue to many of our, of our friends on Capitol Hill. But this will dominate Capitol Hill over the next 60 days. Do you think the president has the capacity or the ability to sway members of Congress to kind of see things his way? I think you should never underestimate the power of the president to uh, impress upon his his uh, members on Capitol Hill to support uh, actions he's had, and he's had a good run lately. Let's let's be serious. He's he's had a pretty good uh, performance of late in terms of getting what he wants. The real question will be ultimately whether or not center right Democrats, I think, who are very skeptical of this deal, will vote 
uh, for principle or maybe because of their trust and devotion to the president. I think it will really come down to that debate. Plus, it's going to be a political hot potato on the campaign trail. Scott Walker, when he announced he, he was running for president, or he, he said last night, rather, uh, that, that he'd kill this deal on day one. Lindsey Graham has said, uh, this is a terrible deal. I really fear that we set in motion a decade of chaos. So this is going to take on a whole new, um, I think, heightened sense of urgency because of the campaign, right? Oh, I think it's going to get enormous attention because of the campaign and also because it's probably the most prominent foreign policy agreement since the end of the Cold War. This is of historic proportion, whatever you think about this, and it will be very fully debated on Capitol Hill. It's going to dominate the headlines, it's going to dominate Congress, and it's going to dominate the campaign trail for at least the next 60 days, probably longer if there's a presidential veto. And Kareem, you, you alluded to this earlier, but can you just describe in, in, in fairly simple terms the impact this will have on the Middle East writ large, if you will, I mean, when, when it comes to countries like Iraq and Saudi Arabia, the rise of ISIS, you know, how do you see this playing out in, in those corners of the world? You know, at the moment, Katie, it's been, it's been a day of celebration for Iranians and a day of mourning for Israelis and, and Sunni Gulf Arabs and, and many Syrians who are worried that now, all of a sudden, Bashar Assad, who's been responsible for over 200,000 civilian casualties, um, will, will be, will be um, you know, in, in, enriched financially. Um, but, you know, over time, it, it will have a, an uncertain effect. One, one, one example that people talk about a lot is the fact that whereas 15 years ago, the, the, it was perceived that the threat of radical Shiite Islam emanating from Iran was America's chief national security concern in the Middle East. Um, there's now a perception that the threat of radical Sunni Islam from, from ISIS and Al-Qaeda is the chief security threat. And in that context, Iran is, is you know, perhaps more of a tactical ally than it, is, than it is a foe. So I think that as a result of this nuclear deal, I'm sure Secretary Kerry is going to see if he can try to build cooperation with Iran on other areas of, of mutual concern, whether that's like Iraq ISIS? or Syria, like and, and and ISIS. And you know, I I I, I think it you know it remains to be seen whether Iran can be more than just a kind of a temporary tactical ally, because you know over time uh, since, since 1979, Katie. The U.S. and Iran have actually had numerous common foes, whether that was Saddam Hussein or the Taliban, Al-Qaeda. And there have been times, moments of tactical cooperation, but it never really turned into kind of a strategic cooperation. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that that could happen as long as Iran's current supreme leader um, remains in charge. But, you know, as we know about the Middle East, it's eminently unpredictable. That's for sure. And do you think sort of the threat of ISIS, Mark, was kind of a looming over the heads of the negotiators in terms of the possibility of Iran assisting and, and thwarting that threat? I don't think so. I think that the biggest issue looming over the negotiations was the proliferation issue. Well, what will happen with other countries in the Middle East? And right now, Iran, 19 countries have civilian nuclear power but don't enrich uranium. Iran is now enriching uranium as if it is a nuclear threshold state. Our friends in the Gulf, Saudi, Saudi Arabia and others, have all said they're going to want exactly what Iran wants. And what that means is you have the potential for many more countries added to that list of countries that will maybe enriching uranium and getting closer to being a nuclear uh, weapons threshold state. That's very dangerous for the region. And I think that's the biggest issue looming over the, over the debate. And so since our, our one of the most searched questions on Yahoo to, about this was what happens next, other than Congress, like, what does happen next? Well, I think you'll see some competing statements by the government. I guarantee you that Iran will put its own spin on this. The United States will have its own characterization. There will be a rich debate. The IAEA, uh, which is the nuclear watchdog agency, will, has supposedly signed an agreement with Iran that will, they will begin to go examine the previous military work that Iran did in this nuclear deal. That will be very key. It's very important that we understand what Iran did militarily before, and hopefully the IAEA will report quickly on that. And you'll see all this moving towards September when there will likely be a UN resolution. So it'll be, the president will present it to Congress. There'll be briefings in Congress 
a lot of robust debate. Critics will come out in force, and I think those supporters will come out in force. And then it will all focus on Capitol Hill, then the Security Council, and then the IAEA. All right. Well, to be continued, Absolutely. needless to state. Mark Wallace and Kareem Sajapur. Kareem, thanks so much for talking to us Thank from you. the Carnegie Endowment in Washington. And Mark, thanks so much for your insight. Great Thank to you. see you. This has been a Yahoo News special report. I'm Kitty Couric in New York. Thanks so much for watching.